Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Chiefske, and we are back another episode of the Golden Age. This is our series of Warhammer Fantasy Battle Reports, and this is Battle Report number 132. It is a 3,000 point battle that's fought between orcs and goblins, as well as lizardmen. My friend Brother Grimm is bringing Wapocalypse now, his 3,000 point orcs and goblin army, and I will be playing the Lizards of Waz, my 3,000 point lizardmen army. So in case you're tuning in for the very first time on this channel, first of all, welcome to my channel. That's the first thing I want to say. And secondly, what's happening is that uh, my studio has created a 3,000 point Lizardman army using some leftover bone splitter miniatures as well as some uh, secondhand Lizardman army to make a 3,000 point Lizardman army. And what we're doing is we're actually taking this Lizardman army and going through its paces by having it fight every single army within our studio's collection. So this is the fifth battle that the Lizard of Waz will be fighting in, and it is has a victory so far of four victories as well as zero losses, so it's actually doing really, really well. And it's going against my brother Grimm's, uh, my friend brother Grimm's brand new uh, Wapakalus Now army. He's actually adjusted his army list quite considerably since the last time we decided to play against Orcs and Goblins, and we'll talk about that when we get to the deployment pictures. So that being said, ladies, we're going to play some background music real quick. As the music is playing, we will show you photos of both armies as well as their rosters. If you want to see exactly what we're bringing for this one, take a pause and take a look at your leisure, or check down the description box below for more information. So with that being said, let's get this battle report on a roll. Krom, I have never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. No one, not even you, will remember if we were good men or bad, why we fought or why we died. No, all that matters is that two stood against many. That's what's important. Barbara pleases you, Kram. So grant me one request. Grant me revenge. And if you do not listen, then the hell with you. Assemble the army! So the scenario rules for this one is Battle Line is the most typical game of Warmer that we play on this channel with standard deployment as well as standard victory conditions. So now the scenario rules are over, let's go ahead and talk about battle plans as well as deployments. So here's an overview shot of the entirety of the battlefield. As you can see, we are playing on a six foot by four foot table. My friend Brother Graham is deployed on the near side of the table while I'm deployed on the far side of the table. Now, as for my tactics on this one, this time I'm gonna play a little bit defensively this time around. And the reason why is because my opponent is playing an orcs and goblin army. So getting in close combat is pretty much what his whole army is all about. So my plan is to whittle down his army as quickly as I can using some long range magical attacks and then hopefully to do a counter charge and finish him that way on mass. And that's pretty much what I'm kind of going for this one as well. Now as for Brother Grimm, Brother Grimm's army, uh, his battle plan on this one is actually quite detailed. As you notice, he's got two huge fort formation of goblins on either side of his flank, and those guys have three fanatics apiece. His plan is to secure his flanks using his goblins, armor short bows, and their fanatics, while his fighters in the middle do most of the damage. As you can see, he has two huge horde formations of orc biggins as well as black orcs. At the same time, in the center right in front of his unit, he has a huge unit of uh, squig hunters, uh, squig herd. He's got seven uh, squig herders as well as 17 cave squigs in there. His plan is to send that thing forward as quickly as he can to basically make like a squig bomb. So if anything happens to the squigs, it'll blow up and basically, you know, just eat everything within range alive. And then have those Doom Direct catapults support him while the giant goes on the right hand flank and smashes my main line and his two horde formations charge forward. So I do have my work cut out for me on this one. My plan is to whittle down his flanks if I can. That way I can get a full envelopment on those horde formations and destroy him that way. And that's pretty much the battle plan that we're going with on this one. So with battle plans over, let's go ahead and talk about deployments. All right, first of all, let's go ahead and talk about deployment for Wapocalypse Now, Brother Grimm's 3,000 point orcs and goblins army. On the left hand side, that unit is called them, uh, the, those backstabbers, is a unit of 39 night goblins with standard bearing musician. They have short bows and netters, and also have three fanatics in that unit. And leading that unit is a character called the Shrink and Shroomhead. He's a night goblin shaman. He's a level two wizard with the lore of undeath. He's got Rise, the Grave Call, as well as Arcana. 
Ar uh, Akar Aran, the Dark Riders. He's got a Dispel Scroll, as well as a Terrifying Mask of E to give him terrifying rules for uh, his characters. And that pretty much makes up his left hand flank. So in the center, of course, is where most of his forces are located at. Up in the front, that is those Bone Breakers. It is a unit of Night Goblin Squig Herders with seven Squig Herders as well as 17 Cave Squigs. Right behind them on the left-hand side, that is called the War Boys. It's a unit of 39 Orc Biggins with full command. They have light armor, shields, and choppas. They also got the War Banner for plus one combat resolution. And also leading that unit are two characters. We have Rugged Stunty Flare. He's a savage Orc Great Shaman. He's a level four wizard with Lord of the Big Wa. He's got Fists of Gork, the Hand of Gork, here we go, as well as Foot of Gork. He's got Fencer's Blades to give him weapon skill 10, a Channeling Staff for plus one, uh, uh, plus one for his channeling uh, dice, and Crown of Command to give that unit stubborn. And also in that unit too is a character called the uh, Crimson Killer. He is a Black Orc Big Boss. He's also the Army's Battle Standard Bearer. He's got Heavy Armor Shield and a huge array of weapons. He also has a Standard Discipline, giving this unit plus one to the leadership. Now right next on the right hand side, that is a unit called the Immortals, as a unit of 39 Black Orcs with Standard Bearer Musician. They have Heavy Armor Shield and a huge array of weapons. They have the Immortals upgrades, giving them Hatred, and they have the Banner of Eternal Flames, giving them Flaming Attacks. And leading that unit, of course, is the General of the Army, Grimgore Ironhide, the Incarnate of Beasts. He is the special character, he's also the General for his army. He's also the End Times Rule character with the Lo Greater Locus of Gur. And he's got Get Snick, his axe, as well as Blood Forge armor. And then right behind them are Dem Kamikaze Boys, which are two Goblin Doom Diver catapults. And finally, making up his right hand flank, he has them Sneaky Gits, which is another horde formation of 49 goblins. They have standard bear musicians, short bows and netters, and three fanatics. And right behind him is Undead Fred and Loon, which is a giant who also has war paint. And that makes a deployment for the Apocalypse Now. So, onto my deployment for the Lizards of Waz. Up forward, using their vanguard rules, are the Charizard, which is a unit of three uh, Pterodon Riders with Fire Leech Bullets. And moving on to my main battle line, on the left hand flank, on the far left hand side, it is called the Jurassic Jousters. These have 10 Cold One Riders, a musician and standard bearer. They also got shields and spears, and they're mounted on Cold Ones. And right next on the right hand side, that character is called the Gatorade. He is a Saurus Old Blood with a shield. He's also got uh, Fencer's Blades, Glittering Scales, as well as a Talisman of Durance. He's also riding a Carnosaur. He's also got uh, Blood War and Loping Stride, and that Carnosaur's name is Powerade. And that makes up my left hand flank. And make up the center of my army, I have two huge units. On the left hand side, that unit is called the Guacamole Guards. You have uh, 36 Temple Guards with full command. They have halberds, light armor, as well as shields. They also got the standard discipline for plus one leadership. And lean that unit as well is my army's general. His name is Kermit the Slan. He is a Slan Mage Priest. He's also general of my army. He's got the Battle Center upgrade as well. He's also got level four Lore of High Magic. He's got the Lore Master ability for that because he has the Channeling Staff, which gives him plus one on his channeling attempts. He's also got Focus of Mystery, which gives him um, the Lore Master ability for high magic and harmonic convergence so that way he gets two additional uh, dice whenever he rolls for channeling spells and then right next to him on the right hand side is called the saurus which is a unit of 40 saurus warriors the musician standard bear and they have spears and shields and finally making up my right hand flank on the left hand side that is the karma chameleons a unit of 24 skinks with full command they have lustrian javelins and shields as well as three crocs of gore equipped with great weapons leading that unit are two skink priests we have slag he's a level two wizard with the lore of beasts he's got wisdom's well form of the amber spear he's got the sword of striking to give him magical attacks and he's also got the cube of darkness and right next to him on the right hand side is snarl he's a skink priest level one wizard with the lore of heavens he's got the comet of cassandora for his spell he's also got a dispel scroll as well as a ruby ring ruin and on the far right hand side, we have the Bulbasaur, which is a Bastillodon with a solar engine. And that makes my deployment on the right hand flank. So with deployment over with, we go directly to the top of turn number one, and both Brother Grimm and I roll off for initiative to see which of us will be going first. So that takes directly to the top of turn number one for the Orcs and Goblins. My friend Brother Grimm got the initiative on this one, so he'll be going first, and this photo is taken after the movement phase. And as you can see, he pretty much just marches up forward as quickly as he can with all of his forces. He has his goblins actually moving up their maximum movement allowance, followed up by the, those bone breakers in the center. And he's got the war boys as well as the uh, immortals on the right hand side, followed by Undead Friend the Loon. Now, if you'll notice, there are four war boys that are missing on the base. And the reason why is because my friend Brother Grimm did fail his animosity test with that unit. But since he has the, uh, the Crimson Killer, which is his battle center bear that's located in that unit as well, he basically used his uh, unruly mob ability to basically just crack some skulls and because of that three of the war boys died in order to do so and that pretty much makes up his move phase for this one so here's a close of them backstabbers marching up as quickly as they can to close a distance with my main line so it's a huge unit of 40 goblins with netters and here's a close-up of the War Boys, and of course three of them did die because of the unruly mob ability from the Crimson Killer who basically had to kill a couple of these guys to show them how things are done. 
And here's a close-up of those bone breakers, that huge squig herd, which is basically a squig bomb because it has the minimum amount of squig herders and the max amount of quick squigs uh, taking uh, points so that way they can go directly into my main lines. And finally, here's a close-up of the Immortals, as well as them back, uh, those uh, Sneaky Gits, as well as Undead Friend Loon, moving up as quick as they can to engage my forces. So now that the move phase is over with, we go directly to the Magic phase. So during the Magic phase, I was able to shut down most of the Lords from the Great Wall from Ruga the Stunty Flare. I managed to shut down most of his spells. However, the spells I was not able to stop, however, was uh, our... Uh, Akaron, the uh, the Dark Rider spell that uh, the Shrieker Stream had cast. He basically caught that spell off match, put me in a five hex rates, pulling him right in front of both Power Raid and Gate Raid, as well as my Jurassic Jousters put into a blocking position. And uh, that pretty much makes up his magic phase for this one. So with the magic phase gone over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. And unfortunately for my buddy, Brother Grim, he did not have a really successful ma uh, shooting phase. First of all, for his first uh, member of the Dim Kamikaze boys, he actually rolled a misfire once. So because that one of them did blow up and got destroyed, which is kind of sad. The other one did fire, but it basically missed its shot, flew way off to the side, and basically landed in the middle of nowhere, not causing any problems at all for that one. And that pretty much makes up the shooting phase for Brother Grim. So with the shooting phase over with, we skip the combat phase because no one's engaged in close combat. And we go directly to the bottom turn number one for the Lizardmen. So that takes regular bottom turn number one for the Lizardmen. And this photo is taken after the movement phase. And the first thing I do, of course, I declare a charge forward with uh, Gatorade and Powerade. I go directly into the front with the, uh, directly into those five hex rays that are summoned up by the Shrinking Shroomhead. And the reason why that is the case is because my uh, character there, he's got Fencer's Blade, so he does have magical attacks. And let's face it, he's going to basically bring the hurt on these hex rays pretty severely. Now, the rest of my formation pretty much stays exactly where they're at. Like I said, I'm playing defensively on this one, but I do of course do fly by my Charizard directly right behind uh, the goblins on this one as well. So because of that, uh, the Fanatics do get popped. My buddy Brother Grim decided to send him up four just because he didn't want those Fanatics going back to the back ranks and causing damage to his own main line. So he does send them up forward. They do get scattered up to the point, but they don't actually uh, hit any of my units at all. So because of that, it does kind of cause a traffic jam for my buddy because that means his Fanatics will be blocking his advance forward on the left-hand flank, which is nothing but good news for me. So here's a close with the Charizards who flew right next to the uh, uh, the sneaky gits so that I'm uh, sorry them backstabbers so that way I can pop the Fanax. The Fanax are flying forward and pretty much remaining harmless. And here's a close-up of those fanatics moving up forward, kind of scattering a little bit there on the left-hand flank. So it will kind of uh, affect his left-hand flank advance forward. But at the same time, though, it also secures his flank from being countercharged by my own forces. And here's a close-up of Gatorade and Powerade charging directly into those five newly summoned hex rays. And I'm really looking forward to that because I know uh, my Osaurus uh, Old Blood's not going to have no problem whatsoever putting the hurt on these guys. And finally, in the background, you can see here all the rest of my forces stand exactly where they're located at because there's no need for them to move forward. So with the movement phase over with, we go directly to the magic phase. And during the magic phase, I do cast the Comet of Cassandora and put it right in front of those Bone Breakers. Now, the reason why I put it right there in the middle of the table is because my opponent's got to spend the rest of the turn moving up forward to engage my forces. I'm not planning on actually meeting him. I'm making him come to me so that way I can whittle down his forces. And hopefully my plan here is that by the time he does engage with my forces, the Comet will be right behind his main line. So when it comes crashing down, I'll basically wreck his own guys and leave my guys pretty much harmless. So... That part was pretty cool. And my opponent was unable to stop that spell because I got it off with Irresistible Force. Plato! Mirada! <laughs> So I did miscast 10 on this one, so because of that, uh, my guy Snarl, oh uh, sorry, Slag, uh, he basically loses his one and only spell that he actually had because now he's no longer a wizard. He can still channel powering di uh, Power Dice, which is great, but other than that though, he's not really casting much of anything. You know, he does have the Ruby Ring of Ruin, so that way he can still Hadouken foes with fireballs, but other than that though, I'm not bringing down the comet anytime soon. At this point, I also saw a golden opportunity as well. I realized I could use uh, to walk between worlds in order to move my Jurassic Jousters forward. The idea here is that way I could destroy his Night Goblins on the left-hand flank and also get rid of the Shrinkish Shroomhead from summoning up any more undead uh, Legion uh, units to pop up on the battlefield. So because I did manage to cast the boosted version of Walk Between Worlds, as you can see my Jurassic Jousters move through everybody no problem using Ethereal, and he popped right back on the other side there of the Fanatics, get ready to charge forward directly into those Night Goblins. And lastly, the Bubble Star managed to fire off the boosted version of the Beam of Chotek. He actually got the maximum uh, hit on that one. Managed to put two wounds directly onto Undead Friend the Loon, and the side effect, he also has minus one to his weapon skill and Ballista skill until the next magic phase for the Bubble Star. So that part was kind of nice too. I was able to finally get that spell off after four different battle reports. So number five, I guess, was a lucky charm on that one. 
So with the magic phase, or with it go directly to the shooting phase, I do open up my Fire Leech Bolas from my Charizard directly into the back ranks of the, uh, of them backstab us. Magic killed two of those guys, so not too impressive, all things considered, but I can still drop rocks later on, which will be all kinds of awesome. So with the shooting phase, or with it go directly to the combat phase, and the combat phase, Gatorade had no problem killing four of these hex rays, which is all kinds of awesome. Leads to say, though, because the difference in combat res, my opponent was able to do anything back to me. Now, with combined with the charge and the four kills I have, the combat resolution difference managed to pop off the very last of the hex rates, and so because of that, that unit is gone. Now, sadly, I don't get any points for it because it's a summon unit, but still at the same time, though, it's kind of nice to know that my uh, Gatorade and Powerade can take on either five hex rays with no problem. So with that, we go directly to the top of turn number two for the Orcs and Goblins, and this photo is taken after the move phase. As you can see in this photo, what ended up happening is that the Night Goblins uh, decided to charge forward. The uh, Backstabbers decided to go directly into the Jurassic Jasters, catch me in close combat. And the reason why I thought was kind of weird at first, I was like, why are the Goblins charging my Jurassic Jousters for? And that's because at the time I was unaware that he had netters in that unit. Uh, we actually pretty much play a uh, closed list for the most part. I don't really know what my opponent's really taking until after the battle report when I make these battle reports. So I had no idea that he had netters on there. And that's why he charged four, because he realized he could actually drop my strength down from four to three and basically make me just normal humans with my uh, cold ones as well as my Sars cavalry. So that's the reason why he charged forward. Now, as you can see, for the rest of his movement allowance, he pretty much just marches up forward as quickly as he can. He does try to charge forward with those bone breakers at the beginning of the turn. Unfortunately for him though, he failed his charge. I think he went forward four inches, I think is what he decided to do in that one. So because of that, he decides to move up everybody else right behind them for the most part. Undead Friend of Loon taking the point on the right hand flank alongside with the no sneaky gets on the right hand side as well. And uh, as you can see there, the Fanatics also moved out as well. One of them crashes directly into the ruins in the center of the battlefield, so he gets killed. Another one drifts over to the left hand side next to that Black Root Shack on the left hand side. And then one of the other Fanatics actually went through his own unit and managed to kill a couple more Night Goblins, which is absolutely hilarious in my opinion as well. Now, as much as his move phase was not as impactful as he wanted to be, Brother Grimm was kind of lucky because all of his units passed their animosity test. So here's a close of them backstabbers charging directly into my Jurassic Jousters, and I thought it was kind of a weird move, but I should have known something was up because uh, my buddy Brother Grimm is quite a cunning opponent, so I knew something was up with that. At the same time, one of his fanatics do manage to kill a handful of his night goblins, which is kind of funny, and the other one kind of scatters to the left-hand side. And here's a close-up of his third fanatic smashing directly into the ruins and getting killed in the same time, which is kind of hilarious. And here's a close-up of all of his main forces with the, those bone breakers filling their charge forward directly into my thesaurus. At the same time, you can see the war boys as well as the immortals bringing up the back, moving up as quick as they can with underfed Fred and the loon taking point on the right-hand side. And finally, there's a close-up of those sneaky gets on the right-hand side marching up forward as well, so that way they get within range, so that way they can do some uh, shooting later on. And that pretty much makes the move phase for this one. So the move phase over with, we go directly to the uh, magic phase. And in the magic phase, my buddy Brother Grim managed to get the Hand of Gork spell off on Undead Fred and the Loon. Actually makes him go up forward, I think it was 26 inches is how far he could actually land if he wanted to. And as you can see in this photo, Undead Fred and the Loon just lands right smack dab in the middle of my battle lines along my right hand flank of my thesaurus. So that is a really bad position for him to be in because he can cause all kinds of harm on my right hand flank for my thesaurus. So that part was kind of sad. Now, you know what you're thinking, you're thinking, Commander Chiefskate, why didn't you use the Cubic Darkness or your Dispel Scroll or just Paradise to dispel it? The reason why is because he got that off with Irresistible Force. Plateau! Marada! <laughs> So because of that, Brother Grimm did miscast 7, which means a small plate play goes off. Managed to kill 3 of his orcs. Now his uh, orc shaman is perfectly fine because of his ward save. He actually rolled a perfect 6 on that one, so his wizard is perfectly fine. However, everybody else, not so much. So with the magic phase over with, you go directly to the shooting phase. And unfortunately for Brother Grimm, for his last of his kamikaze boys, he rolls a second misfire, and he rolls a 2 on that one. So because that, that Doom Tiber catapult does explode and destroys his two Doom Tiber catapults, uh, which is awesome for me, but not so great for my opponent. Really felt his pain on that one, so I guess the dice were not just with him on this battle report. However, those D sneaky gets, however, opened fired with their short bows directly into my Karma Chameleons. And the reason why that's such a bad thing is because he managed to get 30 shots off of those short bows because of his volley fire. As you can see in this photo, he almost quartered my unit. He managed to kill eight of my skinks. Oh, sorry, not eight of them. He managed to kill, was it, 13 skinks right off the bat. So that part was horrific. Luckily for me, though, I was able to pass my panic test because of cold blood. Because when you roll for cold blood, you actually roll 3d6 and you actually take away your highest result. So because of that, my skinks were basically holding in line, which is actually kind of good for them, all things considered. 
So with the shooting phase over with, you go directly to the combat phase, and this is when I realized my opponent, Brother Grim, has netters. Now, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with netters, what ends up happening is that you're uh, the general, the other ones and goblins, my buddy Brother Grim rolls a d6. On a roll of a 1, which means that his netters accidentally entangle his own unit, and he actually suffers minus 1 strength to his own unit. But anything else, though, you actually have minus 1 strength to the attacker, and that's exactly what happened up here. So which means my source cav are now strength 3. Same thing with my cold ones, they're strength 3, which makes them as strong as goblins in this case. So as you can see, after it was all said and done with the combat i do manage to kill eight goblins which is absolutely fantastic they do manage to kill two of my source cab which is not so great because i only have 10 of those guys i do win combat but he does have more ranks than i do so because that he is steadfast and he's within range of his general and his battle center bear so his night goblins are not going anywhere so with that, we go directly to the bottom of turn number two for the Lizardmen, and this photo is taken after the movement phase. And as you can see, for the most part, um, I don't really do all that much movement, or any dramatic movement, I should say, rather. Uh, most of my forces pretty much stay where they're located at for the most part. The only two things I do move, however, a couple things I move, however, are my Charizards. My Charizards march fly over to the right-hand side, uh, right behind the main line of the Immortals. The reason why is because I'm planning on having them go to the right-hand flank to where the Goblins are located from uh, those, uh, those Sneaky Gits, so that way I can pop the Fanatics for those guys and get rid of those and hopefully block up his right-hand flank. I do move up my Skinks from the Karma Chameleons. I move them up their normal movement allowance, so that way they're within range to open fire with their Javelins into those Night Goblins as well. And then finally, I do activate the Bulbasaur. He turns over to the left-hand side, so that way you can beam the Chotek uh, the heck out of Undead Friend the Loon, who's right behind that building. You really can't see him because he's kind of shrouded by that building. And that pretty much makes up my movement phase for this one. So here's a close-up of my source, uh, my Jurassic Jousters, still engaged in close combat with them backstabbers, and uh, with a minus one to their strength, so that part's kind of rough. And here's also a close-up of the Charizard, march flying as quick as they can along the back ranks of the uh, Wapakalus now, trying to make their way to the right-hand flank. And here's a close-up of the Source, the Guacamole Guards, as well as Gatorade and Powerade, pretty much staying in their own ranks. Uh, as you can see, I, I did make a mistake earlier, forgot to mention this. Gatorade and Powerade do move back towards the main lines away from my enemies, so that way I can do a coordinated counter charge when the time comes. And finally, here's a close-up of the Karma Chameleons who just move up their normal moon allowance. So that way they can open fire with javelins at the uh, those sneaky gits. At the same time, you can see the Bulbasaur turning to the left-hand side to fire the beam at Chotek at Undead Fred and the Loon. So the move phase over with, you go directly to the magic phase. So during the magic phase, it's pretty uneventful. My opponent, Brother Grim, was able to dispel most of my spells that I wanted to get off. However, for the Comet, the Comet does not come down this round, so because I get another token put onto it to add to the strength and the range of when the Comet does finally crash to the earth. And I do manage to get off uh, Wiston's Wild Form off on the Karma Chameleons, giving them uh, plus one strength and plus one toughness. So now they're strength three, toughness four skinks, which is all kinds of awesome. And at the same time as well, I do manage to get the boosted version of the Beam of Chotek off. I think it was the level four, five one is what ended up happening. So because of that, I do manage to put three more wounds on Undead Friend the Loon. Unfortunately, I was not able to finish off that giant, which I have a sneaky suspicion is going to really haunt me later on in the next turn. So with the magic phase over with, it go directly to the shooting phase. And in the shooting phase, as you can see, I open fire with my Lucian Javelins directly into uh, those Sneaky Gits. I do manage to kill six of those guys, so that part was absolutely awesome. Unfortunately, though, it wasn't enough to cause a panic test, but, you know, I'll take what I can get at this point. So the shooting phase over with, you go directly to the combat phase. And in the combat phase, once again, I do manage to kill a handful of Night Goblins. Manage to kill five of these guys, which is all kinds of awesome. However, they're also able to kill one of my Saurus Cab, which is not so great for my Jurassic Jousters as well. I can't really complain, though, because my Jurassic Jousters are actually doing pretty well, considering that they have minus one to their strength. Unfortunately for me, though, uh, Brother Grimm's Night Goblins from Dembackstab still have an additional rank more than I do. Uh, so because of that, they are steadfast, and they roll off on their unmodified leadership using their General's Inspiring Presence rule. So they're perfectly fine, and they're not going anywhere. So that takes directly to the top of turn number three for the Orcs and Goblins, and this photo is taken after the movement phase. And of course, my buddy decides to clear a charge. Those Bone Barricades go directly into the source and catch those guys in a frontal attack, as well as Undead Friend the Loon, who charge directly into their left-hand flank, as well, right-hand flank as well. So because of that, now my Thesaurus are actually caught in a pincer attack between Cave Squigs as well as a Giant, so... That's never a fun time. At the same time, as that is happening, he also moves up his forces forward as, uh, as well. He actually, I think, marches up the War Boys as well as the Immortals, moving them up their maximum moon allowance directly to the center of the battlefield. At the same time, the right hand side, those Sneaky Gits also move up forward their normal moon allowance of four inches, so that way he's within range to pop the Fanatics. As you can see, two of the Fanatics land up right in the area between my Karma Chameleons as well as uh, those Sneaky Gits on the right hand side. Now, one of the uh, 
one of the um, fanatics actually goes for quite a bit. I think it goes for 12 inches. Goes through my Karma Chameleons and kills a handful of those guys, as well as put a wound, uh, two wounds, directly onto the Bulbasaur. So that part was kind of sad as well. And meanwhile, the fanatics left hand side, as you can see, they're kind of drifting to the left hand side, not much doing of anything. So here's a close up of the Fnatic going on the left hand side, heading directly towards that ruined building on the right hand side, which is perfectly fine with me because it's not heading to my main battle lines. And the same thing, the same thing with the second Fnatic on the left hand flank, heading to the upper left hand corner of the battlefield as well, staying away from my main units, which is perfectly fine with me as well. And here's a close up of uh, his uh, Dim Backstab is still engaged in close combat with my Jurassic Jousters, as well as the War Boys, who are marching up as quick as they can towards those ruins, heading directly towards my Guacamole Guards. And here's a close-up of those Bone Breakers, as well as Ended Friend of the Loon getting a pincer attack on my Thesaurus. And I'm actually not looking forward to that fight because Cave Squigs are no joke in close combat and neither are Giants. So that's going to be really, really painful here in a little bit. And here's a close-up of the Immortals moving up as quick as they can, marching forward directly towards my main battle lines. And here's a close-up of those Sneaky Gets with two of their fanatics popped up right between them as well as the Karma Chameleons. At the same time, you'll notice my Karma Chameleons are also moving a couple of skinks because that third fanatic went through them and killed, I think, two or three of them, I believe. That third fanatic passed through my Karma Chameleons and also hit the Bulbasaur and went past him, putting two wounds on my Bulbasaur as well. And that pretty much makes up the uh, movement phase for this one. So the movement phase over with, we go directly to the magic phase. And in the magic phase, good gravy in the magic phase, my opponent Brother Grimm managed to get the foot of Gork off. He managed to get the boosted version of that spell off as well. And because of that, the foot of Gork smashes once and actually smashes twice directly onto my guacamole guards. As you can see in this foot, he managed to kill nine of my guacamole guards, which is horrible. He managed to put three wounds onto Kermit the Slan as well. Luckily for me though, I did manage to pass my panic test, so my guacamole guards are still holding their ground. And I was unable to stop that spell because Brother Grimm used Irresistible, irresistible force to get that spell off. Klaatu! Miranda! <laughs> Brother Grimm miscasts 5 on that one, so he does take a strength 10 hit uh, for his uh, wizard. His shaman, uh, Ruga the Stunty Flare, actually loses the wound. Same thing with the Crimson Killa, which is his battle center bearer for his army. He also takes a wound as well. At the same time, managed to kill 5 members of the Warboys too, which is kind of funny because all of the damage done to the Warboys so far has all been self-inflicted, which I find just hilarious but then again that's also the breaks for playing orcs and goblins so that being said and done we go directly to the combat phase now, i do apologize for the angle of this photo it just seems kind of hinky because we're taking photos from one direction but i really did this so that way you could see the giant and see what was going on because that building there in the middle of the picture was really obscuring it from the other side of the table so as you can see in this photo quite a bit happened here but it's absolute bloodbath between the source as well as those bone breakers as well as undead fred and the loon between the bone breakers as well as undead fred and the loon they managed to kill uh, 13 of my source warriors from the source so that part was devastating. Now, there was some payoff, however. I did manage to kill Unfred Friend the Loon, managed to slip that last wound through and killed him. I got really lucky on the fall. He actually fell backwards. So because of that, uh, totally avoided hitting my thesaurus. So I really got lucky on that one. At the same time, I also managed to kill, what was it, nine? I think I managed to kill nine cave squigs in the end. So that part was absolutely fantastic as well. Needs to say, my opponent actually won this fight, but I do have more ranks than my opponent does, so because I'm still steadfast, so because I do roll off on my modified leadership, and I stand my ground, which is absolutely fantastic. Meanwhile, a close combat between them backstabbers as well as Jurassic Jousters finally takes a turn. My brother, brother Grim rolls for his net, netter's ability, and he rolled a 1. So because of that, the goblins are now strength 2. They lose 1 strength to their uh, attacks in this one. So they do manage to kill one of my Jurassic Jousters because, let's face it, I'm still fighting a bunch of goblins. However, though, I was able to kill 10 night goblins, so that part was pretty awesome as well. Uh, needless to say, my opponent lost this fight by a landslide. He had to take a break test. Unfortunately for brother Grim, he failed that break test. I think he fled six inches, and I think I went forward ten. So because of that, my dresser jousters run down. Uh, then backstabbers managed to kill all those night goblins, as well as uh, the shrink and shroom heads. So no more level two wizard popping up undead legion characters. So that part was kind of awesome as well. So with that, that takes us directly to the top, uh, bottom of turn number three for the Lizardmen, and this photo is taken after the movement phase. And as you can see in this photo, pretty much still kind of just standing my ground for the most part. There's no need for me to march forward, especially since the Comet of Cassandora is right, located right smack dab in the middle of the table. 
So I'm just buying my time for the most part. I keep the guacamole guard exactly where they're located at. Same thing with Powerade and Gatorade, so that way I can do a, a counter charge if I have to. At the same time, though, I do march fly my Charizard directly right in front of those sneaky gets on the right hand side, right between the Fanatics, as well as that Unit Night Goblin, so that way I can fire Leech Bullet one of those uh, Fanatics and kill them, hopefully, so that way it's not a problem. I also turn the Bulbasaur to face off against those sneaky gets, so that way I can hit him with the Beam of Chotek. And lastly, I do a swift reform real quick with my Jurassic Jousters, so that way looking at the back ranks of the War Boys. Hopefully, I can catch those guys in a pincer attack between Gatorade and Powerade, as well as the Guacamole Guards, as well as my Jurassic Jousters, but only time will tell. And currently, of course, my Thesaurus are still engaged in close combat with those Bone Breakers. So here's a close-up of the Jurassic Jousters in the movement phase, turning ready to look, look getting ready to charge the back ranks of the War Boys. And looking back now, I realize that was kind of a major mistake that I made, uh, sending my Source Cat forward like that. The reason why is because they be, could be caught in the blast radius of the Comet of Cassandora. Kind of a rookie move. I have to say, I got my Bloodlust up and uh, shouldn't have done that. I'm not a Corn player. I'm a Lizard Man player. I should be playing better than this. And here's a close-up of Gatorade, Powerade, as well as the Guacamole Guard staying their ground, so that way I can do a counter-attack when the time comes. And at the same time, here's a close-up of the Bone Breakers fighting against my Thesaurus. So, those Cave Squigs, man, those guys are super deadly with Strength 5 attacks and Weapon Skill 4. And my own warrior is only Weapon Skill 3, so that part's kind of bad. And here's a close-up of my Charizards, landing right between the Fanatics as well as the Sneaky Gits, so that way they can take those Fanatics out with their Fire Leech Bullas. And lastly, here's a close-up of my Skinks from the Karma Chameleons, as well as the Bulbasaur. And that pretty much makes it my move phase for this one. So with the move phase over with, we go directly to the Magic phase. So during the Magic phase, the Combat of Cassandora does not arrive yet, so it gets another token, which adds bu buffs to its strength, as well as to its range when it finally does arrive. I do manage to cast the boosted version of Soul Quench off directly onto the War Boys. Managed to kill four of those guys. Not as powerful as I was hoping it was going to be, but then again, you know, my opponent is playing Orcs. They're all Toughness 4 standard, so, you know, them's the breaks, I guess. At the same time, I do manage to kill three members of those Sneaky Gets using the Beam of Chotek. I believe I got the basic one, which is D6 Strength 4 hits, so because I do manage to kill three goblins, so not as impressive as I prefer, but still, three less goblins I gotta worry about. However, the Peste Resistance of the Magic Face, however, was casting the boosted version of Hand of Glory. I managed to cast that on the source. Magic cast the boosted one, so that way you get plus two to their movement, plus two to weapon skill, plus two to ballista skill, and plus two initiative. And it's kind of funny. To be honest with you guys, I'm going to kind of go on a tangent on this one. I always thought that the Hand of Glory spell was kind of worthless uh, for the longest time. And that's because whenever I used to play uh, with Lore of High Magic with Hand of Glory, I was always playing High Elves at the time. So because that High Elves are pretty good weapon skill, ballista skill, initiative already, so I was figuring... What's the purpose of having this spell? Now, as a Lizardman player, however, I can definitely see the appeal of Hand of Glory on this one because Lizardmen are not really good in terms of weapon skill, nor initiative, or movement for that matter. So having all those being boosted, huge, huge boon for this army. Basically, these guys are now movement six, weapon skill five, uh, three initiative Source Wars, because Source Wars only have initiative one. So that part was kind of neat. So I definitely see the appeal now for Hand of Glory. So with the magic phase over, we go directly to the shooting phase. In the shooting phase, my Charizards kill off one of the Fanatics, while my Karma Chameleons kill off the second Fanatic as well. So there's nothing now between my Karma Chameleons as well as no Sneaky Gits, which is actually kind of nice. So with the shooting phase over with, we go directly to the combat phase, and I made a mistake, and we'll talk about that now. And that mistake is I forgot to take a photo of the combat phase. So I do apologize for that one. Um, I just totally forgot to take a picture. I don't know why I forgot to take a picture, but I did. But just to give you guys a little information about what ended up happening, what ended up happening is about the source managed to kill off the last members of those bone breakers, managed to kill that unit off to the man. So that part was kind of nice. Also took some losses as well as a handful of losses from those cave squigs, but you know, them's the breaks. So with the combat phase over with, we go directly to the top of turn number four for the orcs and goblins. So that takes directly to the top of turn number four for the Orcs and Goblins, and this photo is taken after the move phase. And as you can see in that photo, um, the, those uh, those bone breakers are gone. So that that point is. Uh, so once again, I do apologize for not taking those pictures. Now, continuing on with the uh, move phase. So my buddy Brother Grim decides to declare a charge with the Immortals. The Immortals try to charge forward directly into the source, but unfortunately, though, he fails his charge distance. I think he goes up for like five or six inches. Is what he ends up doing. So he missed his shot by two inches. Is what ended up happening. 
uh, feel they may connect with my uh, thesaurus because of that. So because of that, instead of charging anything else forward, he pretty much does a lot of swift reforms real quick, so that way he can prepare himself for being countercharged. Uh, he puts the war boys into a column formation, five wide and also five deep, so that way he gets rank bonuses. At the same time, he does exactly the same thing with those sneaky gets on the right-hand side as well, so that way it looks like he's prepared for me to countercharge against him. And that pretty much makes up his move phase. So here's a close-up on the Fnatic's left-hand side. He does smash directly into the building, so he does get killed from that impact, so that part was kind of sad. And the second Fnatic on the left-hand side moves dangerously close to our main lines, traveling 10 inches to the right, so that is pretty scary. Not looking forward to that guy smashing into something. Meanwhile, the Fnatic on the right-hand side that was next to the Bulbasaur, he does crash into the building to the left, and he also gets killed there as well. And here's a close-up of the immortal of uh, the immortals who failed their charge. They moved up six inches forward. At the same time, you can see the swift U form on the left-hand side with the war boys taking a column formation so that way they can get rank bonuses. And here's a close-up of those sneaky gets on the right-hand side doing exactly the same thing so that way they can get rank bonuses as well. So with the movement phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase because unfortunately for my opponent, the magic phase uh, was pretty much uh, a no-show. Those no sneaky gets open fire directly with their short bows directly into my Charizards, and they do magic kill one of my Pterodon Riders. I do pass my panic check because, uh, let's face it, cold blooded don't break, and that pretty much makes it the shooting phase here on the right hand side of the battlefield as well. So, with North Coast Combat going on, we go directly to the top bottom of turn number four for the Lizardmen, and I charge forward for the kill. Uh, as you can see in this photo, the first thing I do, of course, is I declare a charge forward. With my Charizards, my Charizards go directly into the right-hand flank of the Immortals, so that way you catch those guys in a pincher attack. I also send the Swords charging up forward as well, smashing the front of the Immortals and catching them in a pincher attack from the front as well. I then send the Karma Chameleons, the Karma Chameleons charge forward directly into the front of uh, those Sneaky Gits. And I do try to do a flank charge with the Bulbasaur, but unfortunately though I miss... Uh, I, uh, Fill my charge distance, so it only goes up four to four inches. Meanwhile, on the left-hand side, the Jurassic Jousters go directly into the back of the War Boys, as well as Gatorade and Powerade going to the left-hand flank of them. And then finally, I also send the Guacamole Guard directly into the front of the War Boys as well. Now, the only thing that's bad about this is the Comet of Cassandora, as you can see right there in the middle of the table. If the Comet comes down this scene and this turn, it could damage my units as well, but that is the risk I'm going to take because I'm smelling blood in the air and my Lizard may want to kill. And that's the reason why I go forward. So here's a close-up of Gatorade and Powerade, as well as Jurassic Jousters, as well as the Guacamole Guards, getting into a three-way envelopment right on top of the War Boys. I'm looking forward to that combat to see exactly how that goes. At the same time, this is the forward combat with my Thesaurus going directly into the Immortals, as well as my Charizards, the right-hand flank of those Black Orcs. Now, I have no illusions. I know my Charizards aren't going to do anything to these Black Orcs. I only charge them up forward because I need to make room for my Karma Chameleons to go charging forward into those Doe Sneaky Gits. And finally, here's a close-up of the Karma Chameleons smashing directly into those sneaky gits. So with the move phase or with they go directly to the magic phase. And in the magic phase, once again, the comet does not come down again. So because it gets another token placed on top of it. If you're wondering what those little check marks are on that little uh, placard, those check marks represent the different tokens of the comet. So when it finally does arrive, it's going to cause all kinds of damage. So that part's pretty insane. However, though, I do manage to get a bunch of spells off during this magic phase. I decide to use the Lore of Life. So one of the lore abilities for Slan Mage Priest for Lizardmen is that they can actually substitute one of their spells for a different spell if they want to. The first spell I tried to cast was Arcane and Forging, so that way I can get rid of Gitsnik, which is the weapon that, uh, what's his name, carries, that uh, Grimgore Ironhide carries. Unfortunately, though, that spell did not work. I was able to get that spell off. So because of that, uh, I basically trade that spell out for, uh, well, I did try to get that spell going, but my opponent was able to dispel it. That's what ended up happening. So I did try, of course, trade that spell out for another spell, which, of course, was Flesh the Stone, which I decided to use on that one. Magic cast Flesh the Stone off once again onto my Thesaurus, so because of those guys are now Toughness plus two, so these guys now Toughness six uh, Thesaurus Warriors. I also, again, once again, cast uh, Hand of Glory off onto my Thesaurus as well, getting the boosted version off and getting maximum. So that these guys are now movement three, plus three, plus three weapon skill, plus three business skill, plus three initiative. So that part really came in handy as well and once that spell was done i then traded out for another spell from the lore of life which was regrowth so once again i cast regrowth managed to get the d6 plus uh d3 plus one on that one but i was able to bring back i think four of my yeah managed to bring back four of my guacamole garbage kind of nice as well as heal another wound on cover the slam which is absolutely fantastic as well so with the magic phase over with we go directly to the combat phase 
So in the combat phase, the fight between uh, my Karma Chameleons as well as those Sneaky Gits. Uh, once again, the Sneaky Gits also had Netters, so because of they throw the Nets directly onto my Karma Chameleons, making them minus one to their strength, so that part was sad. So because of that, the dust settled, they managed to kill five of my Skinks, so that part was kind of sad. However, though, I did manage to kill 12 of their uh, Night Goblins, and that was primarily due to my Croxagore, the ones who basically did most of the wounds on that one. I think of those wounds, eight of them came from them, I think. So, needless to say, I won this battle by a landslide, which is all kinds of awesome. And the reason why that is the case is because my opponent basically got reduced down uh, enough for me to make that break test. So he has, does have to take a break test, but... Brother Grim rolled Snake Eyes. I guess Gork and Mork decided that this was not the day for these Night Goblins to run. He rolls Snake Eyes and they stand their ground for another turn. Man, these, these, these Goblins, man. I'm telling you what, man. These Goblins are causing me all kinds of problems. It's insane. Meanwhile, close combat between the Saurus as well as the Immortals. It was an absolute bloodbath. Corn would be pleased when this is all said and done. So in the end, my opponent was able to kill six of my Saurus warriors just with Gringor Ironhide alone. He got all six of his attacks. He actually missed one, but with the Always Strike first ability, he was able to strike back again. As you can see in this photo, he managed to kill 12 of my Source Wars was all said and done. Uh, he decided to use great weapons for his uh, Black Orcs, for the Immortals, so that way they get the higher uh, minus to my AP for my, uh, for my armor saves for my Source Warriors. Me, however, I was able to kill 16 Black Orcs. It was absolutely insane, the amount of bloodbath that took place. And that's because of the Predatory Fighter build. I got a lot of sixes on those rolls, so they got additional attacks as well. That higher weapon skill really, really came to effect on this one as well. It really helped me out to balance the scales on these guys as well. So needless to say, I won this battle by quite a substantial amount. Brother Grimm, of course, has to take a break test, and he fails that break test. He flees seven inches, I charge forward nine, so just like that to my thesaurus, run those guys down and murder them all. As you can see right there, the immortals are no more, nor is Grimgord Ironhide. Now the only problem is, of course, I'm right next to the turn marker for the comet, so that's not so great, but at the same time though, I netted myself some juicy, juicy points. At this point of the battle report, that Brother Grim decides he's going to call on this one just because he knows there's no way he's going to be able to recruit his points from the amount of stuff he's lost so far, and he pretty much surrenders at this point, ending the game with another victory for the Lizardmen. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go directly to the after action report because this battle report is now officially over. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. Sure, I could have stayed in the past. Could have even been king. But in my own way, I am king. Hail to the king, baby. All right, folks, now it's time for the after action report. This is the part of the battle report we talk about what went well, what went poorly, and what we claim for the next time that we do battle. This is the after action report for the Golden Age Warhammer Fantasy Battle Report number 132, and this one ended up being a victory for yours truly. In the end, I was able to score 2,193 victory points, while Brother Grim was able to score zero victory points. For my losses, I didn't lose any of my units. As for Brother Grim, however, he lost Grimgor Ironhide, the Incarnate Beast, the Shrink and Shroomed, those bones, those backstabbers, the Immortals, those Bone Breakers, then Kamikaze Boys, as well as Undead Fred and the Loon. Now, this battle was an overwhelming victory. Now, granted, Brother Grimm did cause a lot of damage to my army, but he wasn't able to destroy any of my units, and the reason why is because the size of my core units really helps him to survive longer in the game. I think the main problem with this battle report was that Brother Grimm was faced with a traffic jam. Sending in those bone breakers really affected his ability of sending his main killers forward, like his war boys as well as the immortals. And the reason why is because traditionally the squig bomb technique is really useful against shooting heavy armies, but the problem was that my lizardmen are not a shooting heavy army. So it prevented Brother Grimm from committing his black orcs as well as his biggins forward and he couldn't get that explosion he wanted of squigs just destroying random units at the same time. However, he did do a, bad, do a beautiful job protecting his flanks with his Night Goblin horse, so he did a really good job on doing that as well. At the same time, Hand of Glory as well as the Lizardman's high magic lore ability really saved me in this battle. It allowed the Dasaurus to survive against the onslaught from the Immortals, which really turned the tide in this battle as well. And I really love the way how the high lore magic as well as the magic rules really synergizes well with the Lizardman army and really helps it out. I am thinking about taking out the Bulbasaur, however, out of the army list. I mean, of the five battles, he was able to use the Solar Engine finally, which isn't really all that good because... Uh, you know, if you're only using it once every five battles, you could definitely put those points into putting something else. 
However, though, I am still debating it, though, so I'll get back to you if I decide to change up my army list. In the end, though, this was just another fun game against an amazing opponent, and as always, I am looking forward to the rematch against Brother Grimm. Currently, the Lizards of Waz army is sitting now at 5 victory as well as 0 losses. So that's going to do it for this one, you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is always appreciated. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's going to do it for this one, you guys. I will catch you guys next one. Peace out and stay classy.